who hears my prayers, who sees my tears, and will capture my tears because they're precious to him. We are blessed to serve a loving Heavenly Father. And all the things that we do within the church, we need to do those to bring glory to God. Because that's what he intends for us. I have a couple of things that we want that I want to bring to your attention. First of all, if you want to go to prayer conference, we need to hear from you today. He's sharing. She's got the master list at this point because we're we're actually getting ready to take blow up beds because our 17 is growing. So we've got we've got 17 right now, and we are but we're planning for a blow up bed. So. We just let us know if you want to go to the prayer conference today. We need to know that so we can uh, complete our plans. The first song that you heard today is one that we heard at prayer conference. And if you have ever heard over a thousand plus people singing at the top of their lungs, praising God and giving glory to Him, that is what you're in store for if you go to prayer conference. It is an amazing, amazing and it changed my life completely, and I know that God will make it a very special time for you if you get to go. The, the dates are October the 19th to the 21st it's in Arlington, Texas. Like I said, we need to know today so we can start finalizing some plans for um, all the housing and make sure that we have beds for everybody. Also, uh, tonight, we are going to start our small groups tonight here at the church. We're going to do a launch party, and it's going to be a great activity at 5 o'clock. I don't care if you want to go to small groups or not, come tonight and have a good time in a potluck with us. Bring some potluck, and we'll tell you a little bit about small groups, and you might say, I'd really like to get connected with that. So come and try. Check it out tonight, 5 o'clock, here at the church, bring a potluck, and, we're, and if you've ever been to our potluck, you eat well, so come and enjoy. Uh, also, uh, 24th is our Alabaster Sunday, and you know, with all the things going on with the, the uh, churches that have been hit by all of the, the uh, hurricanes, this would be a great time to go above and beyond in our Alabaster offering. We were blessed as a church here to be a part of the Alabaster offering and receive $25,000 toward the building of this building. So, it's a great time for us to give back because God has given to us. And the last thing I really want to share with you, if you look at the bottom of your bulletin, on October the 14th, the Martins are going to be singing at the uh, Central Church of the Nazarene on 81st Street in Tulsa. It is a free concert. All you need to do is go into, and I, they've got the address down there, uh, www.tulsacentral.church. And you, you can register for it and get your spot for free tickets. It just you don't have to, you won't get a, a piece of paper, but they want to know that they have enough seats for all the people that are coming. I promise you, these concerts are amazing. They're things that you would pay a fortune for if you go to like the Gaithers or whatever. But you're going to get a chance to see it free, and we ought to pack the house. They ought to know that Muskogee First is there. So I, I challenge you to get that going and try to join us. And I promise you it will be a night that you will remember. I'm up here with my green slips. That means I have three more, three more people have finished all the books. So what, is, what happens then? Oh, they get instant gratification. That's called Mike and Connie opting for a batch of cookies each. One cinnamon oatmeal and one is chocolate chip. They will make sure that they guard them well when they leave it. Amy asked for something that was diabetic friendly. And I just want to tell you guys that that's enough, that that's available. I don't I don't cook with, with artificial sweeteners, but I have some recipes that are diabetic friendly. So she got some baked apples. So nice time for fall to start. I really encourage you to read the books, they are good. There's some that are listening to the CDs, and um, Chuck back there said he, he listened to them a couple times in, in a row, the same one, and it was still good. So, you know, he was, he was excited about what he was reading. 
Um, so see me if you if you have any questions about it or how to check them out. I just encourage you to do that. Thanks.
Jesus. They're working through the articles of faith of the Church of the Nazarene. There were a total of 16. And of the 16, we've done 15. We talked about the Trinity, God the Father, Christ the Son, the Holy Spirit, Holy Scriptures, sin, freedom of choice, atonement, forgiveness, repentance, sanctification. Today, this last one, um, I'm pretty excited about it. We, we, we've worked through all of these, and I don't know if you've noticed or not, but, but what the Church of the Nazarene places at its foundation, at its core, these bones, these, these bones, these stones that the, that the foundation of the Church is built upon are fundamental. It's, it's not rocket science. God the Father, Christ the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Scripture of the Church. It's, it's not rocket science. These things that we profess and proclaim. And what you might find is that the Church of the Nazarene has the same bones that a lot of churches have. God the Father, Christ the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Scripture. And oftentimes the only thing that really separates the Church of the Nazarene from other denominations are the minor things. For whatever reason, <coughs> We can end up making the minor thing the major thing, and when it shouldn't. It should be more about being united in Christ than about being divided. So today we talk about resurrection, judgment, and destiny. When we all get to heaven, there will not be Baptist Lane or Nazarene Way. There will not be Lutheran Road. There will not be a Catholic housing edition. That, there will be none of that. If you are a member of the Bride of Christ, are you here? So we're going to work through this article of faith, number 16. And then uh, we'll, we'll talk through a little bit of it, and then we're going to be in Matthew chapter 25. Okay. So if you have uh, if you have a Bible, I'd like to go ahead and open to Matthew 25, uh, whether it be paper form or electronic. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll work through that in just a second. This is uh, this is what the Church of the Nazarene lists as its 16th article of faith. And it says this, first, we believe in the resurrection of the dead, that the bodies both of the just and of the unjust shall be raised to life and united with their spirits. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Now, uh, just a quick little segue. Um, when we start talking about dead bodies raising up, sometimes people can, can, can get kind of weirded out and think, oh great, we're talking zombies or something like this. This is, this is, this is like, no. Okay? No. Well, how, how are the dead bodies going to be reunited with the Spirit? You're asking the wrong guy. I don't know. There's a lot of details to this that I just don't I don't have the answers, but what I do know as simple truth is that there's something about time that runs out and Jesus comes again. And when he comes again, he will collect his chosen people to himself. Everybody will rise, but his will be connected to him. There's more to life than our 70 or 80 years. And those who are dead when Christ returns will rise up and be resurrected. The second part, we believe in future judgment in which every person shall appear before God to be judged according to his or her deeds in this life. Now, it says judgment awaits all of us. Um, there's, there are passages in Revelation that kind of bother me a little bit because uh, it kind of gives the inclination that the, that, that the, the redeemed 
won't go through a judgment per se, but the truth of the matter is that everybody will be held accountable. Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? That's, that, that's the test. Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? So, um, so there you have it. Okay? Um, that's, that's what I know. Um, the second part of this speaks to uh, the phrase, uh, each one will be judged according to our deeds in this life. Now, John 13 says that Christians will be known by how we love one another, right? Christians will be known by how they love one another. And Galatians says they will be known by the fruits of the Spirit that are upon us. But James 2.17 says, So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. In other words, faith is to produce works, which means that our outside should be a display of what our insides are. Okay? How we love one another is a display of how God loves us inside of us. So when we say we will be judged according to our deeds, it's not that we can earn our way into heaven by how we physically perform. It's how we physically perform that shows evidence of what God's done inside of us. That's what actually is what we're judged for. Finally, the last part. We believe that glorious and everlasting life is assured to all who savingly believe in and obediently follow Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that the finally impenitent shall suffer eternally in hell. Now, things about this right quick. Um, first, the qualifier for a glorious and everlasting life is to believe in Jesus Christ. But not just to believe in Jesus Christ, but to actually obediently follow Jesus Christ. This isn't from a distance. That means walking right behind Jesus. There's something about intimacy behind that. <laughs> it's kind of, I don't know. Yeah, I'm going to do this. <laughs> she ain't telling me, don't do it. I'm going to do it because she knows the one with it. So yesterday we're at Frankfurt City and we're walking around and stuff. And Sherry happened to be walking right behind me. And as she's walking by, right behind me, she would, with her toe, hit the bottom of my heel. Like this, just being funny. And so whenever I would step, uh, that's what it looked like, you know. So, yeah, fun. But there was something really kind of cool about that. That's the kind of intimacy. No, I'm not trying to trip up Jesus, okay? What I'm saying is that you're walking so closely behind Jesus that there is that kind of depth of intimacy, all right? Are you tracking me, all right? That's what we're talking about. To not only be, um, to, to savingly believe in Jesus, but to obediently follow behind Jesus. And that's not a couple blocks down. Okay, that's not 16 car lanes. I can see you on the other side. No, it's intimately walking behind Jesus. That's the qualifier. Okay. Second part about this is this. There's a there's a a, a phrase that at first maybe bothers us bothers us. It's the finally impenitent. The finally impenitent. I, I want you to hear what what this is talking about. This is the person that doesn't know Jesus as his personal savior. Okay? This is the person that for whatever reason, whenever it comes to this moment in time, the judgment day is here, this person doesn't know Jesus as his personal savior. I want you to understand the full depth of what finally means. That means that there that 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 that, that grace has been allowed as long as absolutely possible. Grace has been extended to the very last second available, and that God has determined that at the moment of judgment day, there is no relationship between God the Father and this person. And that person's destiny is a final decision. That's kind of kind of harsh, but that's that's the that's the reality. So Jesus actually teaches this in Matthew chapter 25. There's three different stories. We're going to look at the third story in, in Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. I'd like to read this for us and uh, have you uh, follow along. If you have your Bibles handy, we'd like to, to follow along. But this is what it says, okay? 
But when the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit upon His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in His presence, and He will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at His right hand and the goats at His left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink, or a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, Away with you, cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry and you did not feed me. I was thirsty and you did not give me a drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refused to help the least of these brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. They will go away into utter punishment. The righteous will go into eternal life. <laughs> Should we pray? <laughs> so it's a, it's a common thing, this thing of separating sheep and goats. And so, why is it a big deal? So I began to kind of look into sheep and goats. I Google it. That's the best theological tool out there. It's Google. Yeah? And I found some things out about sheep and goats. Uh, and in fact, I'll tell you where I found this. is actually a page called sheep one sheepinfo It's actually a tool for FFA and 4-H organizations to teach the difference, you know, just about sheep. But there's a page on there, the difference between sheep and goats. And back in the biblical days, in, in that part of the world, sheep and goats looked an awful lot of life. An awful lot of Thank you. God answers prayer. There are a lot of like in that time frame. So to simply look at a herd of sheep and a herd, a, a, a herd of animals to know the difference between the sheep and the goats to the naked eyes, that just kind of takes some effort. And so I looked at this website and I found some things that were kind of interesting about uh, sheep and goats. Uh, back in the day, they looked an awful lot alike, but they had character differences. Character differences. I found interesting. First is this. Sheep, sheep are dependent upon their shepherd. They're dependent upon their shepherd. They've got to have that leadership. On top of that, they're defenseless. They're defenseless. Sheep, sheep are not able to defend themselves. They're just, I mean, just not. Another characteristic of sheep is they're meek animals. Meek. They're not aggressive, they're not, they're mild, they're, 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 they're not ugly or hateful, they're not these things. In fact, there's another characteristic that's really interesting is that they also have a flocking instinct. In other words, they don't like to be without other sheep. They like to be in the midst of the herd. There's this thing about sheep, that's what they like. Another thing about sheep is that they, they, their diet, it really consists of tender grasses 
and clover. So they don't really get into branches and bushes and thorny things and you know bark off of trees. They eat just grasses and clovers, but they eat all of it. They eat all of it. They eat right down to the dirt. In fact, some people will say they actually pull the roots up, roots up and eat that. And in fact, cattle cattle herders hated sheep herders because they bring a, a herd of sheep in from what I know. I don't speak from experience. Um, oh, I did see a cartoon about this one. Yeah. <laughs> a herd of sheep comes in, wipes out the grass. There's nothing for the cattle. I mean, it's like, if you need a lot more, buy your herd of sheep. Because they finish it off all the way down to the bottom. These are characteristics of sheep. And, and I, I think about I think about them. They got this 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 need for community. This they got this this need of harmony even, and, and they depend upon a shepherd, you know. And, and they they really are quite defenseless. They've got to have protection, and so they look for this. Goats, on the other hand, goats are independent. They are opinionated. <laughs> And they're curious at best. Or they're vulgar and dangerous and destructive at worst. If you've ever been on social media and you've seen videos about goats, or maybe you've gone on YouTube or something like that, and you see these videos about goats, you'll see videos of cantankerous goats. You'll see cute videos of Baby goats in pajamas. I don't know what that's all about. But, you, know, you see videos and pictures of goats climbing trees or standing on sheer rock cliff edges. It's like, how do you do that? You'll see videos of goats headbutting other animals, headbutting humans and kids. Goats are independent, opinionated. Curious, vulgar, dangerous, and destructive. Goats also have pretty much an unrestricted diet. They'll eat just about anything. Grasses, barks, trees, bushes, thorny things. They say that if you have a goat that has poison ivy as a part of its diet, it doesn't hurt the goat. In fact, you can drink the goat milk and develop an immunity to poison ivy yourself. Oh. Nobody else to do that. I can't have it. And the reason why is because they don't have any taste. They don't have uh, hardly any taste buds, so nothing tastes bad. You know, they're not picky eaters. They don't. I can't, can't taste it. You know. And the reasons why the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats are multiple. The shepherd uh, lets the goats out to feed first because they're not so picky and so they'll they kind of go from spot to spot they kind of you know they'll eat trees they'll eat bark they'll eat branches they'll get up on the tree eat from the top of the tree they, you know they eat just about anything that goes into their mouths and some of you are shaking your head because you know you probably get on those right? and then whenever the sheep whenever all the goats are done eating then the shepherd will pull the goats back in, goat herder, whatever you want to call it, and let the sheep out. The sheep will go to town, they'll cut the yard. But you also don't want them to mingle. Um, you don't want to mix breeds. You don't want half goat, half sheep, because that messes with your milk, messes with your meat. And if you're particularly fond of goat cheese, but not sheep cheese, <laughs> There's a different market for that, you know what I'm saying? But another thing is that because goats are aggressive, because they're independent, they can hurt the sheep. They actually cause damage to the sheep. In verse 32 and 33, Jesus says there will be a separating of the sheep from the goats. It says, all the nations will be gathered in his presence, and he will separate the people as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Now, this is an important statement, and I didn't put this in your notes, but if you want to write it down, write it down. The shepherd doesn't separate the sheep from the goats because of their behavior. 
but because of their character. It is their nature to be independent. It is their character to be aggressive. It is their character to be territorial. This is their character. Next week, Cecil will be here to preach. He'll present the message. Sharon and I are going to be at Minister's Amazing Tree. Don't play hooky. Y'all show up. Okay? I know. Cast away. Might as well play. Well, there'll be another cat here. Y'all show up. Okay? The week after that, we're going to begin a series through Romans. We're going to spend about six weeks talking about Romans, particularly about the subject of how character begets behavior. How character begets behavior. It's not what we do, but it's what we are. What we are is what we choose to be. That's where freedom of choice comes into play. We, we've got the choice. And what we do is a product of what we are. Thus, character begets behavior. So to change behavior, our character must change. To change behavior, our character must change. Here's a little thought for you. Leopards can't change their spots, right? Leopards can't change their spots. They're stuck with their character. They're stuck with what they are. We are stuck with our character. The good news is, he who created the leopard can change his spots. That's an important statement. He who created the leopard can change his spots. So, sheep on the right, goats on the left, and they're assigned to these places according to preset parameters of judgment. So, you, you know the parameters, they're in your, in your notes. If, if you want to look through them right quick, I was hungry. I was thirsty, I was a stranger, I was naked, I was sick, I was in prison. And it's the same precepts, the same parameters for the goats and the sheep both. And the sheep on the right, they exhibited behavior that was determined by their character. The king says, enter into the kingdom prepared for you, for I was hungry, and what? And you fed me. Their behavior was exhibited because of the character of them. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was naked and you clothed me. I was a stranger and you welcomed me in. I was sick and you met my needs. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And the sheep have the behavior that displays what God has done inside of them. He has redeemed them. And they are now His. Verse 34, Come you who are blessed by my, by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. Why? Verse 40, Tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. But the gods on the left also exhibited uh, behavior that was determined by their character. The king said, get away from me. I mean, he's not even nice about this. Get away from me. Get away from me. You cursed and filled the animals. For I was hungry. That was the parameter of judgment. Your behavior was, you gave me nothing thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you didn't care. I was naked and you did not clothe me. I was sick and you didn't give me medication. I was in prison and you left me there. And their behavior, their behavior was a product of their character. When did we see you like this? Because when you didn't do it to the least of these, you didn't do it to me. I like the sheep. The goat's behavior happened as a product of their character. So 
the destiny of the destiny of the goats, verse 41. Away with you, you cursed animals, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his demons. Let that soak in for a second. Away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his demons. That sounds kind of harsh. Verse 46, and they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. I tell you the truth, when you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you are refusing to help. Sheep on the right, goats on the left. And goats are goats, and sheep are sheep, and, and they mingle in the world we live in, right? I don't need to fill in the blanks, do I? Sheep are those who have who have said, I I am redeemed. God has, God has changed my spots. I used to be a goat. I used to be a goat. God has transformed me. I'm no longer this independent, vulgar, destructive person. I'm no longer Him. God has not only redeemed me, but He has changed me. I'm no longer the goat. I'm not a lamb. I'm, I'm now a sheep. I'm now his. Goats. Those who don't know Jesus. Those who don't know Jesus. That's the simple part. Those who don't know Jesus. Money, are you being insulting? I'm trying to be. I'm not trying to be. It's not about calling somebody a goat. It's about where the goat stands. The goat stands on the left side of the king. And the king says to the goat, go away. Now, what I'm about to say may sound funny, okay? Because you know me, I'm always trying to crack jokes, I'm always trying to get you to laugh, and you never do. <laughs> What I'm about to say is, it may sound funny. Please understand, I'm not trying to be funny. Um, I'm not trying to be funny at all. It's absolutely serious. We are surrounded. Front, back, left, right. And where we look, we're surrounded by people who are goats. Everywhere we look, we're surrounded. Sheep on the right, goats on the left. Um, couple thoughts and we'll wrap it up. We're going to keep it simple. Um, maybe as you think about the whole sheep and goats picture, you ask the question, okay, well, what am I? You have already made that 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 determination. I am a child of the King. I I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You know, you know what I'm, you know what it is. You know. Don't you? Some maybe don't know. Maybe some no question. This idea being just consider. If you're on the left, it doesn't end well. And I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to pray in just a second. For the church, this is my challenge. Okay? We are surrounded by a sea of people who don't know Jesus. That's just the truth. We are surrounded by a sea of people that don't know Jesus. When we gather together in this place or in small groups in homes or in front of your city, we gather together to be the body and bride of Christ together. That's awesome. 
I want you to understand that Jesus is all about winning the lost. His whole purpose is to transform people from the left side to the right side. Changing from goat to sheep. He is all about eternal life. And so as we gather together, which is great, the mission of the church is to win the lost. So in just a second when we pray, I just want to encourage you, God, help me see your vision. Help me see what you see. Help me to hurt like you hurt. You know what that means? Just simply be willing. God, whatever you want me to do. I've come to find that he's the one who saves them anyway. He's the one who changes their spots. It's not us. Would you bow your heads with me? If you struggle with the question regarding your salvation, regarding your relationship with Jesus, I'm not... I'm not going to invite you to a prayer. I'm not going to challenge you to do this and look up at me, you know, whatever. Uh, I'm going to simply say, hey, have that conversation. Jesus, I want to trust you. Go to that thing. Church, if you watch the video and you say, wow, that really challenged me. And I invite you to pray, God, would you direct my steps? Would you show me where you would have me to go? Help me that when that opportunity comes that I get to be Jesus and stand in somebody, that I'm able to do it, that I'm equipped to, that I'm empowered to. Father God in heaven, we serve the King of the universe. You are the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. You are the giver of life. You are the provider of blessing. And Lord, you chase after our hearts. Lord, I am so grateful. Father, for those that maybe haven't settled the question yet, I pray to Father that this moment, Lord, may they cry to you, may have a way, dear Father, that, that they cry out. I pray to Jesus that in their prayer, dear Father, they ask, dear Father, to settle the question. Lord, I know, dear Father, that since you're all about transforming, I know that you will. Father, for the sake of the church, for the sake of the kingdom, may we be all about your business. The mission of the church is your mission, dear Father, to seek and save the lost, to, to be Jesus in skin, to preach the promises and the word of Christ, to love as you love. So God, may we do so. May we be convicted to do so. And may we be empowered to do so. God, would you guard our steps? Would you bless the efforts of the church, Father? Because come one glorious day, when Christ comes again, you receive the church to yourself. It's going to be a wonderful day. And yet, 
Those that don't know Jesus, it's going to be a horrible day. So God made me get busy. Thank you so much for your faithfulness to us. Now, dear God, I pray that you'd increase our faith. <coughs> Bless our efforts. Guard our steps. In Jesus' name I pray. Bless you. So we're going to have a small group lunch party here tonight at 5 o'clock. Woohoo! I'm telling you. Woohoo! I like that. Woohoo! <laughs> so. If you're going to the prayer conference, I'd like to talk to you and Yeah. So if you're planning to attend the prayer conference, would you plan to see Sharon uh, before you leave? That'd be swell. Everybody good? Okay. Why don't you stand with me? Why don't you give me your biggest, cheesiest grin? Can I turn to somebody and make that same face? That's how I love you. Love you. All right. And then say, I'll see you tonight. See you I'll bring my best dish. Right. <laughs> Does it have to have something in it? And we'll have a good time. <laughs> I love you. You're just missing.